is co-founder of Institute of Play. Just by that as well, he's an independent game designer and he is uh, a professor at the NYC University. This is actually the quest to learn school. So he and his uh, colleagues, they worked on certain different projects which could be built in into educational stuff. And uh, as well, um, as I said before, he's co-author of Rules of Play. So Eric, thank you for being here. Please welcome on stage and everyone uh, prepare for the ludic century. <laughs> All right, so um, uh, just to tell you a little bit about, about who I am, I've worked in the game industry for about 20 years. Um, for uh, uh, about half the time, I ran a company called Game Lab. Um, so I've made a lot of digital games. Diner Dash was probably our, our most well-known title. We did a lot of online games and small-scale games. Um, I'm also working on now doing more independent um, digital games like Lost Words. This is a iPhone game where you are deconstructing works of literature, um, and that's still in development now. Um, I also work off the computer, so I've done, I, I like making games, not just digital games, but also uh, uh, non-computer games. Sometimes they're traditional board games, sometimes they're weird experiments uh, in books or, or interactive narrative projects. Um, I've also worked for the past five years with Natalie Pozzi, who's an architect, and uh, she and I create um, uh, uh, games together. I think uh, Dr. Z mentioned uh, in his great introduction about uh, design working across disciplines. So I've learned a lot from, from collaborating with an architect doing what are large-scale physical games um, for, for museum and gallery and, and festival kinds of spaces. Um, I also do things that are a little bit more on the edge of games. I've worked with the filmmaker David Kaplan on, on a short film called Play. And uh, as, as Daniel mentioned, I'm also the co-founder of the Institute of Play, which is a, uh, a nonprofit organization in New York City that looks at the intersection of games and learning. Um, but uh, most of what I've done is, is, uh, is making games and, and game design. And I, I think one of the things that I found so exciting about coming here is that, um, you know, I think as, uh, actually, let me ask a question. For you in the audience, raise your hand if you are mostly coming from a game point of view. You're a game designer, developer, you're studying games. Raise your hand if you're mostly coming from games. Okay. Uh, raise your hand if you're coming from another design discipline, like architecture, interaction design. Uh, yes, be proud, yes, excellent. Um, uh, and I guess raise your hand if you haven't raised your hand yet. I don't know what, what else would be, maybe you're a journalist or, or researcher, that, a different category of person. So, so it's great that we have a mix of you know, I guess there was a little more than half game people, but there's a, there's a nice spread here. And I have to say that as a game designer, I've always felt a kind of discipline envy, right? Uh, because I've, I make games, and games are ancient. Games are, you know, there's, there are games uh, from ancient Egyptian tombs that are tens of thousands of years old. Senate, there are families of games from Northern Europe or from Africa uh, or from Southeast Asia that are very, very old. Um, as old as image, as image making in human culture or as, as the design of shelter in human culture. But at the same time, game design as a field is, is not as old. I mean, in the Italian Renaissance, we had, you know, Vasari writing about the lives of the artists and ar contemporary architectural theory has its roots in that centuries old writings. But, but game design only recently, really only with the rise of digital games, has it moved from a kind of a folk culture where sports and, and games have evolved uh, sort of over the generations to something that's more like a media, right? Where there are authored works of culture, people thinking about themselves as game developers. That's really mostly just within the 20th century that that happened. So game design as a field is so new. And that's part of why it's so exciting to be in games now, that we are still figuring out what games are and, and how they function and how we create meaningful experiences for players. And a lot of my academic work has been exactly looking at those questions, defining game design, and understanding what it means to, to think critically about game design as a field. So, so uh, I, I teach at the NYU Game Center. I, for most of my career, I've, I've been sort of a part-time academic and a full-time game developer, and I guess I've switched that a little bit. Now I'm, I'm a full-time game, game uh, professor at the uh, New York University Game Center. And uh, 
if any of you are interested, we have a wonderful Master of Fine Arts program in game design that's quite interdisciplinary. We have a wonderful conference coming up in November, if any of you are thinking about coming to New York City, called Practice, that focuses specifically on game design across sports, board games. I think we have a pinball game designer this year, as well as uh, uh, very well-known video game designers uh, speaking. So that, that'll be a great event. Um, and, uh, a, a, and then, and then uh, rules of play as well. Um, so uh, so that, this is how I'm trying to sort of figure out some of these questions. So today, I wanted to uh, kick off this uh, super interesting lineup of speakers and, and wonderful set of conversations today by talking um, about a few things. I want to talk a little bit about game design, but I also want to look a, a little bit more broadly as well. I think that, that Dr. Z's four categories were, were wonderful because they stretched us all the way from thinking about the, the utility uh, and function of the object to, to the usability for the, the person and the seduction, but also to thinking about games contextually in terms of, of how they exist in, in the larger responsibility sociocultural realms. And I think that we, that's what we need to do. That, that's what, uh, so, so today I'm gonna try and stretch a little bit, talk about game, games in and of themselves, but also talk about how games relate to culture at large, and specifically the times in which we live. And so the argument that I want to make today is that games have a special relationship to this historical moment, to the times in which we live. Um, and uh, that, that we're living in a time somehow that could be thought of as maybe defined by games or that games are, are an important way of understanding them. And uh, I. I'll exaggerate this idea with the sort of somewhat grandiose title of my talk, which is the ludic century, right? That this is a whole hundred years time that can be defined in terms of, of play, uh, ludic coming from the Latin word for play, um, and that we're, we're living in a time that, if it's not defined by games, that somehow could be understood in terms of games, or that games can provide a useful lens, although it's not the only way, obviously, of understanding the times in which we live. So what is this, what do I mean by this idea of the ludic century? Well, um, the turn of the 20th century saw the rise of an, an industrial age that was followed by an information revolution in the second half of the 20th century where information became abstracted into the, the ones and zeros of digital technology. Um, and the question that I wanna ask is, What's next, right? What, 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 what maybe comes after this uh, rise in information as, a, as an important era in which uh, technology and culture and society are living? And I want to say that, um, that we're living in a ludic age, right? A time that, that we can usefully characterize uh, by way of play and games. Um, and uh, in the, I don't have, in the short amount of time we have today, I don't have too much time to go into detail, but just to give you an example of what I mean by this, if the, if the, I, I think in the 20th century there were lots of forms of culture, right, that were, that were important and um, everything from music and poetry and theater, but, but the moving image to me was the, 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 the form of culture that, that sort of defined the 20th century, first in film and then in video and then in, in digital video, um, that, that, the, that the moving image was a, was a way that we told our epic cultural myths, that the news was related, that people told personal stories, that, that cultural propaganda from governments and corporate propaganda from, from, uh, from, uh, from businesses was, was distributed, right? That as a form of media, art, and entertainment, the moving, the moving image in very many ways defined the 20th century. Um, and I wanna say that in, in the 21st century, the moving image has been put at play, right? That the experiments in the, uh, I guess in the very late 60s and 70s were the moving image through Tennis for Two and early video games like Pong. Something happened to the, the, the screen-based image, we could interact with it. We could, we could begin playing with it. And that idea that our media has become uh, interactive, modu modularized, customizable, participatory is something that has been accelerating and games are part of that. They're not the only example uh, of that. Um, so today I want to talk about three concepts that relate to this idea of the ludic century, right, of, of the times in which we're living. I want to talk about systems, and I want to talk about uh, play and, and design. And considered together, they are a few things. First of all, they're a way of understanding what games are and how they function. Um, but but um, they're, they're also a way of thinking about literacy. Um, and... Um, 
the ludic century is really not just an argument about games or about history. It's really an argument about literacy. So I'm not a literacy scholar. I'm a game designer. But according to my, my colleagues that are, literacy really just means creating and understanding meaning, right? So it, it allows me to, to, for example, put up a word on a screen made out of letters and, uh, and that, that you can understand that meaning, right? And it's that process of creating meaning and understanding meaning that's literacy. Now, traditional literacy has meant uh, writing, right, as a, as a form of literacy. You can, can write words and understand them. And, and, uh, and in the last several decades, literacy scholars have explored technological literacy, uh, visual literacy, uh, things like computational literacy. And what I want to say is that there's an emerging set of literacies, a ways of creating and understanding meaning that are tied to this sort of evolution of our time, right, this ludic century idea. Um, and so that, that each of these concept systems play in design is a part of these ways of creating and understanding meaning that I feel are going to be very important for people to be literate in the coming century. And the ludic century is, is, is sort of something that I'm saying is going to happen, but it's also something that I, I'm saying is already happening. We are already living in a time when ideas of, of relating to literacy along uh, systems play and design are increasingly important. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you guys some examples. So um, again, games are not the only way of understanding these concepts or understanding the ludic century, but I think that they're, they're, they're an interesting frame and a, and, a, and a good way of understanding that. Okay, so uh, th this is a more theoretical introduction, but let's take a break for a second and, and play a game. So we're gonna play a game together. And uh, the game is called Five Fingers, and you're all gonna, we're all going to play here together. And uh, th these are the, the rules of the game. So I'm going to explain it, and then, uh, then, then we'll all play. So it's a very simple game. You're going to find about four, five, or six people nearby you, sitting in the audience. You might have to turn around in your chairs and, and face people uh, that you may or may not know. Uh, and um, everyone is going to hold out uh, one hand, right? Um, and this hand, it, this is your life, right? This is your five fingers. So if, if you, you really want to hold on to this because if you, if you lose your five fingers, you're out of the game and you have to sit and wa watch the rest of the game play out. One person should, should, should uh, start. It doesn't matter who starts. And after that, you'll go around the circle in, in order, the circle of people. And on your turn, you do one thing. You just point at another person and that person loses a finger. And that's it. And then the next person goes. So it's very, very simple. Uh, it's a very simple game. And the goal is to be the last person left uh, r alive or left with fingers uh, remaining. That person wins the game. So uh, I, I don't think, are there any questions about how the game works? All right, so we're going to get started. So, so go ahead, turn around, find some people near you. Uh, hold out your five fingers. And someone should start pointing. Find, find a group. Find, everyone is in a group, four, five, or six people. OK. <laughs> jump, feel free to jump into a group if you're still looking for one. <laughs> it goes around, in a, if you want to do a variation, you can, but it was just around in a circle, yeah. You could try that if you wanted to. You want to try that variation? How are you playing? Or do we take turns? Uh, you, you take turns. You take turns. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I 
Okay. All right, let's uh, let's see if we can finish up the final remaining games. I think there's a couple groups left. All right, speed round. Ready? Lightning fast. Let's see if we can finish up these uh, final couple of games. Um, I'm gonna. I guess I'll I'll let these guys in the back and start. First of all, give yourselves a round of applause. That was great. Thanks, guys. Very. Uh, Um, so we're, we're going to get back and talk, talk about five fingers, but just keep this example as mind as, uh, in, in mind as, as we move forward. So, so these are the, uh, these are the, the sort of three concepts related to the idea of ludic century literacy. Um, and, uh, I just want to start with the first one with systems. So, um, I think as Daniel, uh, put it very well, systems are a set of parts that, um, that, uh, interrelate together to form a whole. And um, what interests me a, a, a lot about systems and games is that, that, uh, is that one way of defining games, first of all, I don't think there is a definition of game design. I think there are useful ways of defining game design that help you solve particular problems that you may be facing. But one of them that I find very interesting is that a game is a system of meaning, right, or a potential meaning, in the sense that a game designer creates a sort of a grammar or language, which players then use to communicate with each other or, or with a system, maybe if it's a single player game, and find meaning through that. So, for example, in Five Fingers, we take this gesture pointing at someone, which outside of a game could mean a lot of things. It could mean, I would like that particular a uh, piece of apple pie, thank you, if you're ordering maybe something. I don't know, what else, what else could a figure, you could say that's, I accuse you of being the killer, right? I mean, the, a, a, a finger pointing could mean a lot of things. It could also mean, we're the best, we're number one. I guess if you're American, you do this. If you're German, you, is the thumb, is that the number one? Yes, so uh, in America, this means I'm looking for hitchhiking. Is that also <laughs> in Germany? Yeah, so, okay, so it's... So yeah, so we see how the cultural meanings uh, change even the gestures that we do. But in a sense, Five Fingers is its own kind of culture because we uh, uh, enter into that game and decide to follow the rules. And in doing so, this gesture has its own meanings, right? This, this gesture means I'm selecting you to lose a finger, right? As, I think as Daniel came up to me and said, that game is so mean. It's so mean, right? So what's that? Oh, okay, well, that may be your problem. Uh, I'm not, I won't comment on that. Uh, I won't comment on that. Uh, but uh, um, same thing happens to me when I play Five Fingers. That's why I stayed out of all the games. But, um, but it, um, you know, that, so, so there's multiple layers of meaning. So the first meaning is that, that I'm pointing at you and you have to lose a finger, right? And, and, and that meaning, though, has other meanings, right? That, that meaning kind of ripples outwards, and it means other things. It could mean, it begins to mean something like revenge, or, or being mean, or maybe being nice. I saw there was a lot of interesting games that where people were apologizing to each other. I'm so sorry, but I'm going to point at you this turn, right? Um, other times there were kind of squeals of pleasure, right? So, so this is the, you know, this is the amazing thing about games, which is that we we create these systems. Uh, of meaning, and, and, and it's really true that meanings do emerge, right? This is the difference between a chessboard with pieces that are just on a table, and it may be a nice decorative uh, a set of figurines, and maybe it signifies a lot of things. It could signify the fact that 
I'm an intellectual person, so I have a chess, a chess board at my house, or maybe they're, you know, they're the Simpsons uh, cartoon character version of chess, so it means I'm a, like pop culture, and I have, you know, funny, funny humorous things at my house. But once you start playing chess, there's a whole new set of meanings, right? For example, it really matters if this piece is exactly in this square or that square. If they're just figurines on a table, who cares exactly where they're located? But if you're playing chess, it's very important to know if this piece is in this square or, or in that square. So, so games are these contexts where whole new sets of meanings emerge almost, almost magically just because players decide to, to adopt those behaviors and, and enter into those systems. Um, so I guess the question is, what does this have to do with with literacy, right? Um, the idea of systems, this idea that a set of parts that interrelate to form a whole and create new meanings um, as we interact with them, I would say is a, a, a kind of uh, a kind of literacy that is in our lives in a way that that wasn't the case even 20 or 30 years ago. That so many aspects of our lives today are completely intertwined with systems, especially networks of digital information. So the ways that we work and learn and communicate every day, the way that we, we flirt and socialize and romance, the way that we conduct our finances and connect with our governments uh, as citizens, um, the way that we research and, and get information, uh, all of these aspects of our lives are completely intertwined, at least in industri mostly in industrialized uh, countries, completely intertwined with, with networks of digital information. And I would argue that this idea of sort of systems thinking or understanding how a system works, being, being literate in how a system functions, how parts interrelate to form a whole, really is part of being literate today. And that, and that if, you, if, you don't, if you don't really have that sense of how systems function, it's hard to, to, to think about how you would be fully literate and fully functional um, in our society. And I think that, that, that you could argue that, that, uh, that this is gonna become increasingly uh, a part of literacy as, as, uh, as time moves forward. And the connection to games is that I would argue, again, that games, in a sense, are, are the cultural form of systems, or at least they're a, they're a kind of, of cultural form in which systems are very prominent. Of course, every building is a system, every song is a system, every poem is a system, every, every fork is a system, uh, in a sense. But, but games are a form of culture in which playing with the system, testing the, the inputs and outputs of the system, understanding how the system works and functions. If I do this, what happens as a result? That is what it means to interact with a game. So while every form of culture can be considered as a system, I would say that for me, games especially foreground or emphasize the systemic qualities and playing with and understanding those systemic qualities of games as a form of culture um, are, are, are very important. Um, so so uh, um, that's the sense in which playing with a game, every time we play a game like this five fingers exercise, it's like a little laboratory for understanding how systems work, how we generate meaning through systems. And, uh, and in that sense, where the, the, the rise of games in the ludic century, I would say is both cause and effect of this idea of the, the, the increase in the kind of systemic thinking that's prevalent in our culture today. Um, so uh, these three, these are the three elements, um, and uh, I just want to focus uh, on play uh, as the, as the next one. So um, one of the interesting things, and Daniel mentioned this, it was part of your your definitions, I guess that some of which you borrowed from me. So uh, I guess I'm just. Uh, quoting myself now in a weird meta way, is that games have rules, right? So, so these, were the, these were the rules of five fingers. And the funny thing about rules is that um, uh, if you think about game rules, they, they actually don't sound like that much fun, right? I mean, classically, game rules are fixed and rigid and logical. If we're, if we're uh, for example, playing a board game and I'm, I'm moving and I land on a space, and we don't really know what we're supposed to do when we land on this space, we have to decide and agree and resolve that ambiguity before we can continue playing. Or if I'm playing, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm playing baseball, and, and, and uh, we say, well, this tree here is second base, 
Okay, so I'm on second base, and I decide I'm going to touch a little branch way off on the edge of the tree, and I'm still touching the tree. Someone thinks I'm not on base. They tag me out, and I say, but I'm touching second base. No, you're not. You're not. The, it wasn't the, the branch of the tree. It's the trunk of the tree, right? So there's a sense in which game rules are fixed and rigid. We all have to agree on them. They're, they're kind of logical and rational. And when you think about them this way, they don't sound like that much fun, right? Game rules sound like some kind of weird fascistic system that you must enter into in order to you know, play. But the, the, the really interesting uh, thing about games is that when we decide to, to, to limit our behaviors and enter into these systems of rules, what, what results is play. And, and play in many ways is the opposite of rules. So that while, while rules are fixed and rigid and logical and scientific, play is improvisational and creative and spontaneous. And for me as a game designer, that, that sort of paradox, that, that, that interesting tension between uh, rules uh, which then create play, even though they're the opposite of each other in the case of a game, is one of those kind of... Uh, uh, a strange paradox is that I never can quite wrap my head around and, and I think keeps me very fascinated um, uh, about games. So, so le le let's talk about play just for a moment um, since, since today is about defining, defining games and um, maybe we can, we can think about a way of, of understanding play uh, since it's a very important part of, of games and game design. So, um, you know, play is... Um, in English, we have this advantage that play and game are two separate words. I know in German, you know, Spiel and Spiele are, are similar, but in, in English, we have this wonderful word play that means a few different things. So one of the things that play means is, is the, for example, if you have gears, play is the little bit of free movement. You say there's, there's, there's play in these gears if, if they're a little bit loose and can move around, or that, that, there's, that if you have a car, and that there's a little bit of play in the steering wheel, you would say, in English. And so I want to ask, what is this play in the steering wheel, right? What is going on here? Well, there's play in the steering wheel because there's, a, first of all, it's part of a larger system, right? Systems and, and, and play. Um, so so the, the play is here um, in part because there's a system where there's a wheel, and then there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a drive shaft, and then there's an axle, and then there's two tires, right? So, so, this, so this, this steering wheel is a utilitarian system where if I, I turn the steering wheel here, right, these, these wheels are going to rotate uh, in my invisible car. I hope you guys like my invisible car. It's what color, I don't know what color is my invisible car. I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's every color because it's invisible. Um, so so, so uh, there's a utilitarian functioning to this system where I can, you know, turn the steering wheel and move my wheels, but the play in this system is, is the amount that I can turn the steering wheel, and it's not, it's not uh, a slave to the, to the utility of the system, right? The, the play in the system, in a funny way, is there because there's a more utilitarian system. The play is there because there is a more rigid, functional kind of system, but the play is a little bit that's, a, that's kind of um, uh, uh, there despite that system or in spite of it. It's in the interstitial spaces between the strictly utilitarian functioning of the system. So there's a, there's a tension between play and function, right? Which is, I love the word seduction that you used to talk about the, 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 the pleasure, the sensual pleasure, right? So there's a sense in which pleasure is always a tension with a more rational idea of functionality. And so there's, there's, there's play in every system, but often the play is something that, that comes out of it despite the more utilitarian rational functioning. Now I feel like I have to push this car off stage because it's crowding me out. So I'm just <laughs> getting it over the cliff. Goodbye, invisible car. Um, so, so, uh, uh, what I want to say is that in a game like Five Fingers, there was the rational set of rules. But what happened as all of you started playing was something kind of amazing, which is that, okay, you're learning the rules, you're doing this, and suddenly you, it got very loud in here. There were people y laughing and yelling. There were um, people asking to clarify rules, but also uh, doing it a little bit, uh, uh, making up their own slight variations. Um, there, you know, I've, I've seen uh, Five Fingers played where 
you know, it wasn't this finger or this finger if you only have one left. You can imagine which finger it was uh, to. And, and that people start inventing their own variations and ways, ways, ways to play the game. Um, and so that's the kind of um, uh, sponta spontaneity and, in and interesting uh, uh, things that come out of the system of, of, of play once you enter into the rules. So again, even to play a simple game brings us to this very interesting paradox. So just to give you a couple examples, this is Sissy Fight 2000. This is a game that I did that came out in 1999. It was very innovative in its day. It was, I think, the first browser-based game with real-time chat. It's a game about little girls on a playground. Uh, every girl has a 10 self-esteem points. In English, that sort of means your, your sense of value and self-worth. So you're trying to reduce the self-esteem of other girls uh, on the playground. Everyone is a girl. So in a sense, it's... it's uh, it, it's kind of a it's, a, it's not a game for children, it's a very darkly humorous game about childhood, very much a feminist kind of intervention into the game industry, especially then in the late 90s. Um, but, but the thing about Sissy Fight that was interesting is that because it's such a social game, there was all I these kind of interesting forms of play that happened, right? So players would invent their own variations and, and even within the restrictions of a digital game would kind of say, well, we're not gonna play with, with certain actions. We're gonna kind of limit what we're gonna do. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna play without speaking, for example, and make it a silent game. Um, and uh, in addition, within the fan culture of Sissy Fight, there, were, there, there was a, a lot of Sissy Fight fan art. So this is uh, from the American artist Keith Herring. This is, these are from the Sissy Fight Museum of Modern Art, which was online for a while. This is uh, maybe a Dutch, Dutch distill uh, abstraction. Um, uh, 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 of a, this is the, <laughs> of, of the basic Sissy Fight screen um, by one of the players. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of fan art. One of the things in Sissy Fight is a lollipop uh, that you can lick your lollipop and get a little bit of self-esteem back. So this is also from the Sissy Fight Museum of, um, uh, of Contemporary Art with a, with a Picasso, a, a Manet, and a Chagall. So turning the water lilies into lollipops, right? So uh, to, into the green lollipops that you have in the game. So, um, so the idea that, that, that when you have a, a, a systems and structures of play, in this case also happening in games and in other forms of popular culture with fan culture, um, you have unexpected things emerging, right? And as a, as a game designer, I think one of the sweetest pleasures that, that you receive is when people play your game in ways that you never anticipated. So that you, you give them a grammar, a set of rules, a structure, and then they play games, and the way that they play them can surprise you. Um, just like you invent a grammar, but that doesn't mean that you're writing all the books that will ever be written in that language, right? So, so, that, so that players take on what you do with the systems and they, they invent things in terms of play. Um, so um, the, the, uh, in, terms of, in terms of play as a relating to the ludic century and the idea of literacy, um, you know, the idea of, of systems literacy and systems thinking is important, but I would argue it's not enough. The kind of analytic understanding of systems is not sufficient to be literate in this sort of ludic century way that I'm talking about. We also need play. Play is the human element of the system. It's understanding not just that a system is a set of parts that interrelate, but that also there are human beings with their uh, cultural and psychological biases that, that enter into a system. So the, the idea of play is uh, within, this, uh, within this, this larger system is, is that it's sort of a, a messy system. If you think about Wikipedia, for example, Wikipedia is really how we get information today. And so in the 20th century, there were gigantic systems of information that emerged, right? Systems that had to do uh, with huge card catalog systems and, and using first paper to, to, uh, to organize information, pneumatic tube networks uh, that were you know, in, in use in Paris, for example, into the, into the early 70s. Um, and then with digital information, that really expanded what we can do with information. But there's been a funny shift. Information, I would argue, has been put at play in a sense. That the way that we, that we acquire information and get information is less about consulting an, an encyclopedia or a set of experts, and it's more about participating within a community. And Wikipedia, although most people are not creating and editing uh, uh, Wikipedia entries, 
is this kind of weird, messy human system. This is an artwork by, um, this is an artwork uh, called, uh, by James uh, Bridal, who's a writer and an artist. And it looks at this one term, the Iraq War, on Wikipedia from uh, December 2004 to November 2009. So all of these volumes are the, all of the changes and, and content that happened uh, over the course of, of, of those, what is that, five years of this one Wikipedia entry. So all of the changes to, to the Iraq War as a Wikipedia entry are combined in, in, into these volumes, and it's, and it's thousands of pages. And so the idea is that, that Wikipedia is a messy system. It's a, it's a human system. It's a system in which even the rules by which people are, are putting content out and, and policing each other and editing their own content, those rules themselves are evolving over time based on other kind of meta communities within the Wikipedia system. And, and this, I would argue, is the model by which information is gonna happen. That is information put at play, right? That is information no longer in a rigid system where, where it's being handed down from experts to an audience, but where the boundaries between the audience and the experts become blurred uh, at many points. Um, there's one more term I wanted to talk about, and, and that's design. Now, in the context of, the, of, a, of a red dot uh, uh, event, I don't think, I, I don't know if I would be so bold as to sort of try and, try and define design or, or, or understand it, um, uh, but I think that there are ways that I want to connect design specifically to these ideas about the ludic century. Um, so, so in other words, what does it mean for design thinking to be a way of creating and understanding meaning in, in our world today? So for me, connecting design to the ludic century is seeing the world as something constructed, right? In other words, um, uh, that the world isn't something that's given. Um, we, we don't take the, the built environment or the media landscape or a cultural environment for granted, but instead we see it as something that we can, can modify, that we can interact with, um, and, that, and that blurs the line between uh, producers and, and consumers. Um, and I, games do this already in many ways. Um, there are, many, there are many games that are designed for user modification and interactivity. In a classic collectible card game like Magic the Gathering, you have a collection of cards, and in a sense, the player takes on a role of a game designer, and they are having their collection, and they're creating their own little engine of cards that's your deck of cards that you're going to use against someone else without really knowing what they've done, right? So in a sense, beginning to blur the, line, the, the boundaries between... Um, between um, uh, producer and consumer. This is what a uh, game designer Charles Pratt talks about the difference between designing games like tennis and designing tennis balls, right? It's the difference between trying to create a whole system where, where you're going to regulate every aspect of a player's behavior and instead giving players tennis balls and saying, well, you know how to play tennis, but maybe you can invent some new forms of games, right? So it's, it's trying to think about games as something where we're blurring the line between uh, producers and consumers a little bit. And, and this has its roots in the 70s in the work of Bernie DeCoven, who was uh, one of the founders of the New Games movement, where they did a lot of work in uh, trying to think about games as things which evolved, in which players themselves were also designers, um, before the rise of computer games uh, even happened. And I'm exploring this idea in some of my own work too. Sissy Fight has been recently released as open source. So we are through a, through a Kickstarter that we did last year. So that's, that's one way in which we're trying to see what happens when we give that game back to its players. And I wanted to uh, the, uh, talk about one final product of mine, the metagame, um, that also looks at this idea of thinking about tennis balls uh, rather than tennis games. So the metagame is a card game that I did with uh, Colleen Macklin and, and John Sharp in Local Number 12, a uh, little design collective that we have. And there are two kinds of cards. There are these culture cards that have different sorts of, um, uh, different kinds of culture from pop culture and, and, uh, and media and art. And then there are these discussion cards um, that, that you use to make comparisons. And the interesting thing about the, about the metagame as a card game is that it's really an operating system, right? The deck of cards, like a regular deck of playing cards that you can use to play poker or bridge, can be used to play a whole variety of different games. And the, the game is coming out later this year, but already we've seen players, even with our print and play prototype decks that we've made available to our Kickstarter backers, um, them inventing their own variations, people creating special sets just about film so that people that are attending their wedding can talk about uh, films that they like 
um, by, by using the game. Um, so uh, um, just, to, just to finish up, um, I think that uh, thinking, about, uh, thinking about how these ideas work together, um, to me, means a lot of things. Um, maybe today we can think about game design and defining game design and, and ideas within game design and how design relates to other disciplines in the sense of tennis balls, right? In the sense that it, maybe it's less important to, to, to come to some kind of larger grand system that's gonna encompass everything and more think about how we can, how we can bounce ideas around with each other uh, like tennis balls over, over the course of the day today. Um, there's a sense in which the ludic century is kind of a ridiculous idea, right? I mean, uh, uh, it, you know, I'm, I'm making the most kind of gross generalizations about history and culture that you could imagine. And I, obviously, I'm a game designer, right? So you could easily critique the ludic century and say, well, uh, it's a, I'm a game designer, and uh, what I'm saying is that the entire hundred years in which we're living are defined by the cultural form in which I, I happen to make my living, right? So yeah, I love games, I like playing them, I like designing them, I like talking about them. Hey, guess what? Games are the way we're gonna define the next hundred years. So, so there's a very self-serving, narcissistic aspect to the ludic century, but um, I think the ideas that are in the ludic century, the ideas about systems literacy, about making media that are, that are moduli modularizable and customizable and participatory um, are, are there in culture, and games are not the only way of thinking about them. So I just want to make that clear. I'm not saying that games are the only way of parsing our, our present moment. But there's another thing I'm doing with the ludic century as well, which I think is very much related to what we're doing here today. Um, for those of you that are maybe younger and working in games, games are today fairly accepted as a form of something that one can study at the academy, um, as something that can, can, uh, can carry serious ideas. Um, but when I started working in the games industry 20 years ago, games really had a different cultural status. Games were thought of as as first of all for, for, um, for either for super nerds living in the basements of their parents' houses or for little kids. They also were thought of things that were horribly addictive or maybe uh, gratuitously violent. Um, and, and they were not at all thought of as something which could be within the pantheon of great forms of design like architecture or graphic design or of art. And I think that we've seen, we ha really have thing, seen things shift that games are comfortable in the, in the academy now. In the, in, the, in the United States, there was a sort of important moment a few years ago when the New York Times moved their reviews of games from the technology section to the cultural section. So it was no longer with their reporting on you know, Google and, and, uh, and Microsoft, and it moved to with their reporting on theater and film and, and fine art. And, um, and I, would, I would argue that, that for me, the ludic century is also a way of acknowledging and, and, and being happy about the fact that we can be proud today of being game, game designers. We don't have to apologize the way we did 10 or 20 years ago for working in a, in a field that was seen as a kind of junk food of cultural cu cuisine. Um, today, I would rather be a snob and say, well, I like games, and if you don't think they're important, that's your problem. That's not my problem. Um, but um, uh, 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 the ludic century is a way of is a way of kind of encapsulating that idea as well, and saying that games are here; they're important. They're not the only way of understanding the times in which we live, but they're they're an important emerging uh, emerging cultural form that's linked to all of these very very key ideas about literacy. Um, and uh, I, I think that's it. So I just would ask you guys to to for the rest of the day to to be playful, to think playfully, and um, thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you very Daniel. much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I found your car downstairs. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, that was really impressive. So, um, and I'd like uh, the audience to ask you if uh, there are any questions to Eric. So this is the chance right now. This is the first time actually you talked about uh, the the ludic century on stage, right? So. Uh, maybe uh, once or twice before, okay, okay. but this yeah. is a new version of the talk, absolutely. All right, all yes. right. So there was a manifesto uh, published in the internet yes. and yes. Uh, lots of other really great persons in the games industry and in the games culture right. uh, were discussing about it. So, And uh, I think we found a really good example of what you were thinking and uh, what you suggest, what could be happen. And uh, I'm a supporter of that idea. Thank so you. So are there any questions to Eric right now? 
Um, hi, Eric. Thanks for the, um, for the wonderful talk. It's maybe a comment, not a question, but I would like to say I'm really happy that in your definition of design, play has a, uh, and culture has a very big space. Um, when I was thinking about, oh, when, when I'm thinking about gamification and also in, in, the, in the marketing sense, what um, comes to my mind is there is no space for play in those because it's mm. only understood in terms of systems or systemic replication or copy and paste of, of um, rules, badges, and so on and so forth. And when you talk about play and culture, this is exactly this interplay, this loose element mm. that um, is so hard to grasp, actually, because when you try to define fun, it turns out to be a very difficult thing. So. I think it's it's really important that um, it pops up the play element, the things that are the, the softness, the things that are not that easy to um, to define, and that therefore it's it becomes a very difficult task in a way to design a game that is fun, because if it was only about system, it would be very easy. So. Um, yeah, thanks. Th thanks for this input. I, I think, it's I very think that's a I think that's a great comment, and I think you're right that there's a there's a tension between play and fun and pleasure and gamification that specifically has to do with the idea that gamification instrumentalizes games in exactly. the sense that it 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 my my interpretation of gamification is that it takes the sort of superficial aspects of games points and levels etc and then uses that as a vehicle for something else and maybe i'm much more of a modernist but I, I never feel like that play has to be justified because it serves another value uh, in a marketing campaign or even for education or, 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 or politics. We can also be, just remember that play is beautiful. Play, play is a beautiful form. There's a, there's a, I don't see any other hands, so I'm gonna tell a little story. Do I have time to do that? Thank you. So there was a, um, there was a uh, I was speaking at a conference once and there was a, um, there was a, uh, uh, well, I'll say a very famous programmer who helped invent parallel processing, so sort of a hero to technology geeks. And what he was talking about games, and what he said was that, well, you know, uh, I see all these kids and my son playing Guitar Hero, but at least some of them, after you know, playing Guitar Hero, end up actually learning rock and roll guitar, and thank God for that. You know, at least they're getting something out of it. So at first that seems like, Okay, well that makes sense. You know, they're applying gameplay to something else. But if you really think about it, what he's saying is that they learned to play rock and roll guitar. Now, 50 years ago, rock and roll guitar was not only seen as something which was sexually depraved, um, but also really responsible for the decline of Western civilization, right? Elvis Presley and not being able to show him on American TV below the, below the waist. And rock and roll guitar in no way was this sort of commonly accepted idea that of course it's great for kids to, to, to play rock and roll guitar. Um, that's something which has shifted over the decades. And so my question for, for that point of view would be, well, um, uh, you know, I, there's, there's going to be that, that for music, we don't question the, the idea that playing music, composing music, listening to music deeply and critically is just part of being human. We don't, we don't have to say, well, playing, why is playing rock and roll guitar good? Well, because music is a cultural good. I would like to say that games are similarly a cultural good. It's just part of being human to play with each other, to understand games, even to design games um, is simply part of being human and exercises our you know, w many wonderful aspects of our being, and it's just beautiful. It's, it's a way that, that humans create beauty and meaning in the world. And so I, I think in the future, there's gonna be some other form of culture that's gonna be very edgy and dangerous. I don't know what it will be. Maybe people poking themselves with sticks or something, and they'll say, well... In the I'm, virtual reality. <laughs> right, I, well, at least, but at least they're gonna say, at least these kids doing these horrible things to themselves, at least some of them went and ended up playing video games, and thank God for that, right? right? So, so, so in the future, video games are gonna be the, the kind of established cultural thing, but I, I, I would like us to recognize now that play and games are, are, are a cultural good. And I think that it's, it's challenging to, to do gamification just, just for these reasons. When my, my company, Game Lab, we worked with a lot of brands. We worked with Lego, for example, for many years, 
And it's, 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 what's dangerous is that you take a game like Five Fingers and it's fun to take someone that, that's your friend and, and, and flip them the middle finger, right? Because that's sort of what games allow us to do. Often when we play games at, at our most creative, we're playing them in inappropriate ways. We're, play, we're doing things with them that, that they weren't designed to do, but brands are very protective of what are the Lego values, right? Even Lego's a wonderful toy that embodies mod modularization and imagination and construction, but, they, but there's still a nervousness about what kids might do with, with games. So I think that that's, that's the tension that's often unrecognized when, when we use gamification to instrumentalize games as a vehicle for something else. I'm not saying that games can't be part of wonderful experience design advertising campaigns, but I think that that's the tension that often goes unspoken or, or unnoticed. Thank you. All right, very long answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Eric. All right, so I think um, so we stick around the whole day. So uh, thank you very much, Eric. Thank you very so, much. So uh, if you have any questions left, maybe we get time to ask some questions later on. And I suggest that we have a little short break for about 10 to 15 minutes and uh, everyone get some rest, get some air, and maybe you could think of a game where the rules are to change the rules just for, you know, <gasps> yeah, Uke, you know about that, yes, I know. Okay, have a break, and then after that, uh, Peter Warman will be on stage.